yourself and stuff. Okay. Hello guys, I'm um, Parul. I'm a PhD student at BU. This is like a collaboratory project between Red Hat and BU. I'm going to be talking about how in certain applications the main memory can be a bottleneck and we're proposing like a certain mechanism to get around it. Okay. Um, so most modern architectures have multiple cores and you can run a lot of workloads in parallel and they have sharing at different levels of hierarchy and with inherent sharing comes a lack of isolation. There are usually two types of isolation. One is uh, spatial or space-based, which a lot of thought has been given to it and there's lo lots of mechanisms in place to ensure that you have spatial isolation. So like applications of different users are isolated even with the user and the OS and even within the OSs you have um, isolation via VMs. But the other kind of isolation that is there is temporal or time-based. So what do I mean by that is the fact that when um, two applications are running on the same system, when one of the application affects the runtime of the first application, that means there is a lack of temporal isolation. And there are usually three main reasons for it. One is the fact that there's uh, sharing at the cache level, then that the main memory um, is a bottleneck, and also the at the memory controller level because um, the DRAM can only perform so fast. So with keeping all these three things in mind, what really affects your workload really depends on what kind of application you're running. Because like if you have something that's doing a lot of compute and has, um, has no interdependencies and can be run on multiple uh, cores, then none of these things would actually affect you. But most workloads that run on cloud these days not only have compute, but also have um, huge memory requirements. So what do we know about the current uh, DDR structure? So the current DDR4s, you can get the, max, the maximum bandwidth that you can extract from a memory bus is around 20 gigabytes per second. And one of the core on a socket can already extract up to five gigabytes per second. So if you have four cores that are running really memory intensive tasks, you've already saturated the memory bus and any additional um, tasks that you add will have will create contention for this shared resource and you will have a lack of temporal isolation. So we know that theoretically this is going to be a problem, but we also want to see how bad this gets at an experimental level. So before I go into the experiment, I want to talk about the synthetic benchmark that we created. So that what we were running, we had complete understanding of this. So we started by creating a 100 MB buffer array and we just looped over it 100 times. So at one instance, we were uh, in one of our experiments, we were almost accessing 10,000 um, megabytes. We wanted to create low cache locality. So what do I mean by low cache locality? It's that every time I access something in this array, I should get a L3 miss and I should have to access the main memory. So how we did this was every time I looped in the array, and the next entry that I accessed, I was skipping 16 integers. Why um, 16? Because that's exactly 64 bytes, which is one cache line. So the next entry that is 16 integers apart would have been in the next cache line and that would cause an L3 miss and you would have to go to the main memory. So what we did, we were like, okay, we ran this experiment and we actually measured how many L3 misses we were getting using PAPI. And what we saw, there was a 15 to 20% discrepancy in our value. We, so the theoretical value was actually 15 to 20% higher than what we were expecting, which was a little suspicious to us. So, and at this point, we had already turned off all the hardware prefetchers. So what we thought was maybe there's another like prefetching happening that we haven't been thinking about and we haven't been tracking. So we tried another approach. Is Rather than skipping 16 integers, what we did was actually skip um, 
a really huge prime number. So what this does is like from the computer's perspective, it looks pseudo random. So it cannot uh, figure out the pattern that you're trying to access. And this would pre like fool the prefetchers. But what we still saw that Papi was still under reporting our L3 misses. So the hypothesis that we had was the fact that when you use Intel machines, um, their L3 replacement policy is not completely random. There is some kind, this is a pseudo random re uh, replacement policy. So some parts of the L3 cache actually get um, used way more than other parts. So the way we dealt with that was we, rather than having a uh, buffer size of just 100 MB, what we did was we increased the buffer size to be two uh, gigabytes. So what this does in like one iteration, you have way more data and then way more data needs to fit into the L3 because you're accessing it. So even the parts of the L3 that were less likely to get um, uh, evicted, there would be more data trying to fit into those and you would actually replace them at some point, which actually did end up working and um, we ended up getting more accurate results in the N3. We ended up having like a one person discrepancy, but that is much better than what we were seeing before and this kind of proved our hypothesis. So now that we have our synthetic benchmark, which um, th there are two options that we have in our synthetic benchmark. One is just um, performing reads or the other is just performing writes. So we all the experiments that I men, men, talk about in this talk later, I have results for both reads and writes, but for the presentation today, we are, I'm just presenting the write data. So I've explained the synthetic benchmark and we completely understand this. So how bad is contention at the main memory when you use a completely um, memory intensive task? So this is the result we got. So on the x-axis, uh, it's the number of other cores that are also performing right. So you can think about it as number of other cores that are contending for the main memory. So if you look at number 10, that means there are 10 other cores that are also trying to access the main memory at the same time as the core under analysis. And um, bandwidth is uh, what the core under analysis is, how much memory bandwidth is the core under analysis getting. So like I said earlier, theoretically that uh, one core when nothing else is running on the system can um, get around five gigabytes but as more and more cores get activated and you start contending um, for main memory, you see a drop of a performance drop of almost 50%, which is like if a task is really um, latency sensitive, this is a huge drop. So, so we've shown that this is a problem and the fact that um, when you have um, multiple workloads running on the machine, there is very little intuition of how it's going to affect one workload in particular when all the uh, other applications are also contending for the resources. And a lot of actually like actual use cases are there for this. So imagine if you're in a cloud computing environment and you have a premium user who has uh, an SLA agreement or cares about the 99 percent tail latency. So how do you make sure if you're running any non-critical task on the same machine as this premium user, how do you make sure that the premium user is not suffering a lot and is actually making these agreements? The other is in the HPC community, like a typical HPC load um, uh, workload has multiple uh, threads of execution. So how do you make sure that these threads are all getting completed more comparatively closer to each other so that you get a better overall execution time? And even in the real-time system, um, a real-time community, you care about this because deterministic performance is extremely important. And how do you make sure critical tasks actually make their deadlines when other non-critical tasks are also competing for the same resources? So currently, all these industries have their own way of doing uh, solving this problem so like in cloud you have a lot of underutilization of resources because they don't want contention happening in HPC like programmatically people are making sure that everything is getting done as it should be and in real time people are sacrificing um, performance time and execution time by actually implementing uh, software solutions to these problems so 
other manufacturers have also realized that there is a need for innovation in this direction and one such technology that has come out has been Intel and there are two um, two things that this technology provides one is the profiling aspect so if an application is running or um, number of cores or a virtual machine you can um, see what the cache the last level cache usage is for that application number of cores or virtual machine you can also see how much memory bandwidth it's using while it's running the second aspect of this technology is the management part which lets you partition your cache and also uh, divide your memory bandwidth into uh, par par parts and the intuition we had here was that it would maybe look like a traditional network bandwidth controller where you have a reserved quota and of the total bandwidth and you just give it to a subset of the application. That was the intuition we were having as when it, this came out and then we ran experiments to see if we were going in the right direction or not. So before I get into the experiments, I want to just briefly explain the architecture and the test setup. So even with the previous experiment where I showed contention is a problem, we were using this machine and this setup. So we're using the Intel Skylake architecture and it has two sockets. On each socket we have 20 cores and each core has uh, two hyper threads and the last level cache size is around 27 megabytes. So because we wanted as much, uh, as less noise from other things that were running on the system, we took certain kind of precautions. First, we made sure that our CPU was only running at a constant frequency. So when we're, we're not doing memory transaction and doing some CPU workload, we're always getting a constant time rather than some discrepancy in that. We made sure that our CPU was never going into idle state. We turned off uh, turbo boost. We turned off the hardware prefetchers. We made sure um, our, all our experiments are only running run on uh, one of the sockets and all the kernel fun kernel calls and stuff is pushed onto the other socket so it co doesn't interrupt or anything when the experiments are running and give wrong results. Sec lastly, um, the resource director technology or the RDT, there are two ways to control it. So we, the one that we're using is the one, um, the Intel, uh, there's an Intel library on GitHub which lets you m change the registers, the MSR registers and stuff and set this um, thing up. The other actually um, is via the kernel, um, by the kernel which exposes a file system interface which lets you also manipulate this. We have currently turned that off because we didn't want uh, multiple ways to control the same registers and not have, not be able to be make sure that if one of them was changing the other wasn't doing anything. So for the rest of the uh, presentation, I'm only going to be, fo uh, even though RDT has multiple features, for the rest of the presentation, I'll be only focusing on one of them, which is the memory bandwidth allocation. So there are eight classes of service. And these classes of service are 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. And they skip over eight, um, they skip over 70 and 80, then 90 and 100. And, um, so what you do is you take one of the classes of service, you assign it a percentage, and then that uh, class of service is further assigned to a core or a set of cores. And then based on what um, class of service the core gets, you get a delay value. So all this is very theoretical knowledge. Like we don't know what these percentages mean, where, like what are they a percentage of, where is this delay value being added. But so the rest of the experiments we did were try to figure this out and what these numbers actually mean. So on the x-axis we still have um, the number of cores causing contention and on the y-axis we still have the bandwidth of one of the cores under analysis. So the core under analysis is always getting 100% of the bandwidth. And the other cores that are causing contention, they're put on the same class of service. And what we do is we try to assign all the different classes of service to it to see if any of the settings actually gives any protection to the one core that we're giving 100% to. So it means like when we give 40%, then we're trying to say that if all the other cores are being throttled at 40%, does our core that is at 100% actually gain any performance isolation? Because
because you should, as you can see, in the 10 person case, there seems to be some kind of discrepancy here. Because if you look at the this line, it's going right here under the blue line. When there are 12 cores causing contention, you're here. But when you have all the other cores being throttled at 10%, then you actually end up getting way higher bandwidth. So you get like a 45% increase in bandwidth when all the other cores are being um, throttled at 10%. But that's not the case for most of them because the lines for like 90, 60, 50, 40, 30, and 20 are almost at the same level as if there was no throttling being done for them so so this seems like it does not provide any protection to the core that we are trying to isolate so another thing that we wanted to see is like how does when we put multiple cores on one class of service how are these cores actually getting their bandwidth so we had two hypotheses. One was the fact that if you have multiple cores on one class of service, they're all subjected to one amount of quota. So no matter how many cores are there, you should all, the total sum that you get should be about Q. The other hypothesis we had was the fact that if you have more cores, then you're actually extracting, extracting way more of the quota because you're each getting a Q amount of quota. So, if it was case one, where you had multiple cores on the class of service and you're all subjected to one queue, then as more cores ended up getting onto the class of service, your bandwidth for that one core, for each individual core in that class of service should actually decrease because you're all splitting the queue amount of quota that you had. But if you were in this scenario where you had your individual value assigned to you and no matter how many cores came into that class of service, you would still see this value. Then your line should have been a flat line. And we ran this experiment we ran it at 10% so that we wanted to make sure that the system was not saturated because if um, if we actually made the system saturate, we would have de seen a decrease in bandwidth. So we made sure we were running at 10% and we kept adding the cores. And as you can see, we get a flat line. That means that each individual core has its own value or quota assigned to it. That means if you're, if you, even if you're throttling everybody at 10%, but if you have like 10 different cores that are all in that same class of service, then it's extracting like 10 times the bandwidth. So the, the core that you're trying to isolate and you're trying to protect will still see so much more contention if you had all the core share amount Q of bandwidth. So, in, in my opinion, it made more sense to have um, all the cores that are on the same class of service share the amount of bandwidth totally, then you would be able to say if you have X, uh, if your system has like 5,000 megabytes and if you throttle everybody at 10% and everybody has, to, everybody that's in that 10% has to share around 1,000 megabytes, then that 4,000 megabytes that is left over, you have still so much more protection unless, uh, you have so much more protection because no one else can go over that 1,000 bound. So why, why is it that each core has its own uh, quota? It's because the way it's been implemented in the hardware. So because it's in the core part, so this is where the delay is being added. It's being added before, it's being added between L2 and L3. So the delay is actually being added before it even leaves the uh, L3 to go to the main memory. And this is done because because it's much easier to keep track of all the threads when when they are still in the core part because you have the core IDs and everything and everything attached to it. But once it leaves the core part to go to the uncore part, it's much harder to keep track of all these extra variables. So, okay, we have this between L2 and L3. That means that even, even if something is in the last level cache, a delay would have been added to it. And that's the next thing we wanted to see. But before we did that, we also wanted to make sure that it actually made sense to add delays to something that was already in the last level cache. Because 
everybody like every, at least for me I thought that if something is in the last level cache you're already getting such great performance why would you want to add delay to it so but what we saw was on the x-axis we still have the number of cores causing contention and on the y-axis we still have the bandwidth of one of the cores that we're trying to uh, analyze <coughs> What we saw was even when two cores were contending on the last level cache, oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot to tell something. <laughs> so the fact was that the buffer size has been decreased by a lot. So six cores, so before we had our buffer size to be two gigabytes, now the buffer size is only four megabytes. So even when we have six cores, it should easily fit into the last level cache. Yeah? The other cache is still set associated, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you can't guarantee that you have a small chunk of memory that you've got to utilize. But, but the thing is, we're looping, or, looping over it. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it's algorithmic based on the address. Yeah, that's the prob mm -hmm. probability is high that you're happy. So, we still have something massive. 6 times 4 is 24. We have 3 megabytes left. We have one way there. One way there. So, the likelihood that it fits in. So, it will add some noise perhaps at the end of the graph, but in general, if it's completely right, it will fit in. Also, the fact if we loop over it like multiple times, that's some. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, it's also done the replacement, so it's important. Oh, okay, okay. The policy also is to implement so the rule match the. The It's not really random, it's also not. It's not LRU, it's the middle of the day. They call it PLRU, the pseudo random use, which by itself can add even noise as well. And after the figure. Yeah, so the decimal replacement policy does not have the address back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Average So one thing which Fu didn't say is that for this for this machine, we turned off uh, um, uh, memory interleaving. So they actually are mapping linear addresses linear to the URL modules in the mm -hmm. first place, and therefore we have the the hashing policy much uh, much simplified. So oh, in the second stage. Okay. Do you want to add anything, Renato? Yeah, so um, in any case, uh, this result will run multiple times as well. So every time I look at new or physical memory, it's unlikely that even if sometimes you get that sort of unlucky spot where you have conflict that uh, uh, may go out of the cache, right? Uh, because this was run multiple times, in the end we took an average and essentially this trend comes all over again. So something yes. else. Right. So even with like two other cores, you see that your performance is going down. And at even at, so by the sixth, uh, by the fourth core, fourth core that is active, you're almost it like your bandwidth is almost at the same level as if you were going into the main memory. So it seems like even though your data is in L3, your performance is acting like you were going into main memory, which is like pretty shocking to me. I mean, that was shocking to me. I don't know about everyone else. <laughs> So we were we saw that contention is happening at L3 level. So we were like, okay, if this is not helping, if MBA is not being able to provide support for isolation at the main memory, can it provide support for isolation at the last level cache? So we repeated the same experiment where the core under analysis was always given 100%. And all the other cores that were contending were went through all the different settings. But the only difference is that now, rather than having the buffer size be two gigabytes, our buffer size is four MB. So some of, at least for some of the cores, it should have fit into the last level cache. So what we see is, so this line that falls right here is the base, base case where we're not having any control. We are, no one is being throttled and everybody seems to have, by the default setting is that everybody gets 100%, so that's the default case. But if you see that when you throttle all the other cores that are causing contention at 10%, you can almost scale up to 16 cores without having any degradation to your performance. So it, at 16 cores, it's like you are, you are seeing performance as you were hitting the L3 every time. And for when you throttle everyone else by 20%, you are still you can still scale up to almost 14 cores and then 12. And you see that even though that they might not be like these percentages don't like mean something like they're not equally spaced like if they should be, but they're causing some kind of performance gains. Yes. Question, in, in that graph, is, that, is there still one thread who has 100% Yes, yes. 
This is the number of other threads that are controlled at the given percentage. Yes. The graph is actually the one. The one is getting full bandwidth. Yes, so the, ga- the, 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 the one that's getting, getting full bandwidth. Right. Yes. In the presence of a specified number of other threads getting control with those. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, this was good news for us because when we were doing it for the main memory bandwidth access, it seemed like the hardware wasn't doing anything. Uh, so the kind of hypothesis that we came from this was maybe that the delay value is so small for all these like throttling levels that we, it's only stopping it for such a short period of time that these me- all these accesses are hitting the main memory and they're still causing contention because there are so many other accesses already waiting there. So if, we had inc- if somehow the delay value could be increased and we, we could make them um, more sparse at the main memory level, we would actually see the same benefits that we see here at the main memory. So this is what where we are here right now. And I'll talk about a couple of next steps. So, so one of the next things that we want to figure out is the fact that um, clearly there is some benefits in using MBA when the data size was 4 MB, but there were no benefits when it was around 2 gigabytes. So where is this sweet spot where MBA actually works and when does it not? So like clearly there is, at some level, the delay values stop making sense and at some point they do. So we still need to figure, run more experiments with different data sets and different data sizes and see where it works and where it doesn't. The, the other thing is that um, the other thing that we need to also do is like all our experiments right now have been on um, examples that were only doing memory transactions. So like it was either doing one read after the other, or it was doing one write after another write, another write, and there was no actually compute period of this um, experiment. So what we need to do is also simulate a real. Um, experiment which has both memory transactions and compute and the way we would do is like have some kind of memory transaction then have a busy loop then have another kind of memory transaction and just experiment that and see how MBA reacts to that so before I end the presentation I just want to give a very brief thing about what the big picture is so Imagine if we can profile an application for how much memory it uses over a given period of time. So on the x-axis, I have the time, the execution period of um, an application. And on the y-axis, I have the memory uh, that it's trying to access. And then I look at this, I can somehow profile this. I see that this, initially, it wants to access something um, in the L3 by the bandwidth and then it wants to access something in the main memory and then finally it has something that it can access from L1 and L2 so it's pretty fast and the bandwidth requirements it needs is pretty high Uh, and it finishes in X amount of time then if I have all these memory con- like the bandwidth controls then what I can do is I can um, because this was going in L3 and I know that MBA would work on that I can throttle it um, to some amount by using um, MBA then when it was going into main memory if MBA uh, doesn't work then I can use some kind of software based mechanism such as memguard or something to throttle it at a different level and then when it's going into L1 and L2, it doesn't need any throttling and it'll just work as because uh, those are still private. So it would just work. And I would be able to pr- give have a hypothesis or predict the new execution time. So the hope is that we can build an end-to-end system where we can uh, profile a set of applications and then we can co-locate them on um, latency sensitive applications on the same machine. So not only to get guarantees about temporal isolation, but also about um, also to make sure that the machines are getting high utilization and thank you
Um, just out of curiosity, is, do you see a difference, substantial difference between the question? Do you, do you see a stim substantial difference between the read and write? Yeah, you so, so um, it's almost twice. So when you see the... the it must be twice. Yeah, because each uh, uh, write is like twice, two accesses to the main memory. Mm -hmm. So, like, remember that contention gra graph which had a 50% drop? Yep. So, when you're just doing reads, you only get a 25% drop. Mm -hmm. But we don't know yet how the quotas are actually right. Right. by the double writes, whether they count it once or twice. Yeah. Right. And then the second question I had was, does the, uh, do, this is an earlier version of the implementation of this, right? Yeah. Do we have any data on the later version? Well, Joe has to provide us the machine. Right? <laughs> it's his implementation. Yeah, you no, know, we don't have any. No, okay, there's no data at all. So no, I'm just curious. Like, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't look even like. looked at the new machine or anything. Okay. I think. Thank you. A uh, couple of stupid questions. Uh, how many uh, memory sticks did you have in this machine? Like, like, like three? Like memory modules. These are eight memory controls per socket, my thing. Because now we have eight on that. So we probably, this is 256 megabytes. Two sockets, 128 per. So eight. Eight, okay. So you used all the channels? Uh, ideally, yeah. So we were using the channels, whether the mapping of the memory really used all memory channels. That's an open question. So sure. We haven't really seen that, but okay. we really could have used all the memory channels. Okay, thank you. And we made sure that was local memory. Yeah, local yeah. memory anyway, yeah. so that, that's great. So Yep. I'll be quick. So it really is sort of an intuitive, what's your intuition? How workload dependent do you think these, these tunings are going to be? I think they're going to be very workload dependent because so we recently also read that what they did, how they did the delay values, they did it on based on one application. Right. Okay, and we have no idea what these delay values are or have any idea what that application is. So maybe for the application that they used, it, those 10%, 20% actually meant that the bandwidth they saw was actually dropping to 10% and 20%, so they named them those. But I think the fact that we've already seen that when you have different sizes, like I know that was a drastic change in size, but when you have seen the different sizes, there was a change, so I think that workload would change things quite a lot. Yeah, it's, it's not only the, the, the lakes between them, it's also the mix between how many, at any point in time, how much memory you mm -hmm. can a certain time period, etc. So they really had some specific application in mind, and part of what Guru just mentioned uh, in the last slide, what they're going to look at next, what she's going to look at next, because we make what you look at, <laughs> uh, is to have write code, which is simulating the ratio between accesses and write work they are doing, and also randomizing this over time to see whether we can approach the levels of graphs and learn more about the kind of application which is the basic. Right. But it's, so th they don't have an anti-starvation mode. They really only have a rate-limiting allocation mode. The thing is here, so uh, anyone yeah. move? Yeah. Uh, this is a poor man's implementation. <laughs> they try to get the bullet point on the slides for, for, the, for the marketing and so on. And any real implementation for this would have a problem with the implementation would have to sit in off the course. Yeah. yeah. But that's complicated because you need global state for that. Mm -hmm. So they went with a simple thing. They put these uh, the, these uh, COS values in the state of the of the core, and therefore they're affecting the L3 axis as well. So it's yeah, they're right in saying that they can limit the bandwidth utilization, but they don't say the negative side. It's, it's, uh, but on the other hand, I think one thing that came out that for me was interesting, and I was shocked by that, <laughs> is that I uh, you know, typically don't think as an L3 as a bottleneck, right? 
And yet, uh, in some workload, and perhaps we are being uh, overly logical in terms of which workload we deploy, actually L3 is a bottleneck for some type of workload. Imagine you go and uh, try to write your application to be as L3 sensitive as possible because you want data locality and try not to go to in memory uh, 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 so often because you know that's going to be a performance hit and try to fit in L3. And then even if you have a partition, a cat uh, located with cat, still the bandwidth to L3 is going to be uh, uh, it's going to be a perform it's going to give you a performance hit. Uh, and how much is going to be a performance hit? Well, as bad as going to main memory. So you may as well not optimize it at all and just go to main memory if that's the worst case. Um, now, in this poor man implementation that Intel did, actually gives us some, to some extent the hooks to control that kind of contention that we were not aware of. And maybe Intel was not aware of, or maybe they were. Um, maybe they were, that, maybe that's what they were observing when they tested their test case applications. I hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, actually, you have to say so. Guru mentioned at the beginning that in the, in the especially in the field of real time programming and so on, people are already sacrificing absolute performance for predictability. So, if you are writing your program so that it only expects 50 percent of the total performance and implement the restrictions using the available cache allocation and memory backup allocation. So the thing which we might want to get to, but if she manages to get this to the point, is actually to say we can actually guarantee something in the absence of something which Intel has not been, or the x86 processors have not been able to provide in the past, any kind of guarantees. They were simply off limits, were not possible. If we are limiting the workloads in some, perhaps we can get and say where we, we have a tail latency of whatever, which we actually can guarantee. So that would be a positive outcome. So, but the overall, so Karul always felt bad that she didn't have the big thing and can say, I provide you here with a library which can do everything for you. So we, we keep telling her, please tell her as well, so that a negative result is also a good result. It's good publishing. <laughs> A question back to, to you again. In what scenario was the L3 cache um, as slow as going out to main memory? Can you re-describe that scenario? So the one... Oh. It's essentially the case. Where, okay. It's essentially the case where your work, the yeah. working set size of your application, are co-located, are co-running on different cores. Um, it's still the sum of their working set size is still below the size of the L3, and yet because they are all contending on L3 uh, bandwidth, they uh, they uh, they have a person. Yeah, they are all contending for L3, not for a main memory. Oh, right? so it's yeah. Not the bandwidth. Out to memory. Exactly. All the bandwidth L3. Oh, yeah. That's what it's Correct. Like. Right. The control is between L2 and L3. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And on the skylight, L3 is a victim cache. So if you evict yeah. it out of L2, it goes into L3, so you're competing with L3. Right, that's what the problem is. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Right. Correct. That's why writes create more problem right. because you get a read and a write back to it. But also, you can combine this with cache allocation. So you can, in this case, you could. Guarantee that you have it, Correct. but you so, yeah. still would not get the backup. So that the next experiment is like actually split. That was one of the experiments that I need to do, and these people have been telling me to do it for a while. <laughs> is <She's not. laughs> is to put each when when I do this four MB buffer. I actually, so there are, I, there are 11 ways on the machine. So I give one way to each of these six cores, and the remaining ways I give to all the other cores that I'm not even monitoring or caring about, so that make sure that none of these cores that I actually care about take that extra part of the L3 out. Then I run the same experiment when they have their fixed se section of L3, and I know for a fact that their data is in that way. And I would st probably still see the same amount of contention and drop. Mm. Mm. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So if you read the Intel uh, architecture documents that they publish in the errata sections, they do describe on Skylake that yes. bandwidth, cache allocation, cache technology, cache memory monitoring, and memory allocation don't work as described. Yeah. They're, they, 
the cash allocation will not restrict to the yeah. cores. Yeah. It'll leak over. The bandwidth numbers may not be real. The bandwidth, whatever. <laughs> so, and they've been working toward fixing that in Cascade Lake and beyond. Has have you? Seen where that has cost you um, numbers, your irregular, irregularities in your numbers? So we haven't worked with CAT yet, So, but I'm I'm sure I believe you that they were overspilled. The one where we did see a lot of irregularities was when we were trying to use the memory bandwidth monitoring. So, and also, yeah, when we were doing the memory bandwidth monitoring, there were two, two different... Uh, levels so one was local and one was remote and the local and the remote did not always add up to the total correctly and also when we just looked at the total we would only see around 90 percent of our data in there like because we would so when we were doing that 10,000 we would only get around 9,800 9, 9,000 I think yeah something we had some discrepancy in the total amount of data that we were missing. So monitoring, there was some... Sorry. So we had misses all the time. Yeah. The workload was always missing. Missing the... the, the so that's why... One uh, two cash. Was it? Yeah, because we, because we did that whole pseudo-random access and that two gigabytes yeah, to make like sure. The small number you do. No, no, so, but in this case, it's a highly, highly unlikely. So with a two gigabyte reference on a new... If you use a pseudo... If you use a... Um, a pairwise um, prime, cool prime iterator through the array, so you're really making it around. So therefore, you have so many cache lines to access, and there is highly, highly unlikely that the tiny little and one and two cache will remain anything. And she's disabling all the prefetching. That's all I can prove. So it's unlikely that this has to do with any of these. And also, the numbers don't turn out. It's, it's one megabyte in, in L2 cache, so the size is not large enough to make such a difference. So, I got a couple, not questions, but just sort of, sort of comments here. Um, first of all, do you think it's interesting to, since this is a memory bandwidth allocation and control, do you think it's interesting to have a buffer size that fits in the L3 cache period? Wouldn't you so want to miss in the L3 we, as much as possible? Our, that was our initial intuition, yep. and that's why we were doing that huge thing. The, right. But when, when we saw this, I don't know, here, when we saw this, mm -hmm. our in, the intuition was the fact that it's between L2 and L3. That means that the delay is even being added when you miss something. So the, I think there's like the underlying <coughs> implement, uh, like assumption that if you miss something in L2, you're probably going to miss it in L3 as well. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it's easier to implement this in uh, the core part versus the uncore part. Right. But yeah. To go back to the previous one, even before seeing this, the thing that gave away was go back, Wait. back, 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 back toward the beginning. I think. Hey, can I interrupt for just one second? This one, yeah. Uh, right after this talk, um, if you go down to registration, uh, we're giving out the party tickets. Um, so just wanted to let you know if you want to come to the party, it's Friday night, 7 p.m., uh, and it will be here. So uh, continue. I just want to make sure it got in there before we run out to the next session. And then the, the the next thing I wanted to ask is, have you guys thought about the NUMA aspects of the system and how that affects this? It's all local memory. Okay. Yeah. So that's why. And then that's what I was going to ask. How do you how you? It, the, and the, one of the first slides that talked about shared memory here. You're not doing shared memory. It's not system I mean, five it's shared, L3 memory. Sh I mean, shared memory. I mean, it on the one of the first slides oh, on this it talked about using about shared memory. Individual processes. In you're doing malloc or M map or something yeah. to get the memory. It's not system five. I'm shared using memory. and also the fact that I'm using Numa CTL yeah. to make sure that I'm only accessing the main memory of that particular. Uh, right, but it's, it depends on how it's allocated. Well, not, the memory yeah. policy should be the machine has. It's getting. It's, Six gigabyte of RAM. it's coming from Malloc or S Break yeah, or MMAP Anonymous. MMAP, okay. Yeah. okay, all right. And then the other question that I had was do, have you looked at the possibility of the three different page sizes on Intel yes. impacting yes. this? Yes, we have also the, we have experiments for both big pages and normal pages. What about have, like gigabyte huge? Yeah, that's pages, the big pages. pages. How did you get those? How did you get those? Because they won't come from Malloc or MMAP. M no, the MMAP. You have, a, you, you have a new flag that tells you. And and then you can also double check, I, which I did. You checked that, okay. Yeah, All right. I double checked it right. in my code. In the code itself. Yeah. Right, the code that itself checking. I just was curious. 
Yeah, of course. Uh, they're, they're, you know, the first, very first part of it was controlling the variable that can affect the experiment. And, so. and yeah, you had properly measured the misses to the TLB misses for huge pages versus non-huge pages. Okay. All right. Good. Thanks for all again. All right.